I bring you greetings from London. My name is Priyanka Das Gupta. I am professor of surgery at King's Health Partners, and it is my great pleasure to moderate this virtual plenary at the AUA 2021 on artificial intelligence in urology. Did you know that artificial intelligence today is really for everyone? We carry around with us one of the most intelligent devices every day, which is our mobile phone. Just to put it in context, one of the terms that you will hear about in the AI world is machine learning. Machine learning is simply using data to answer questions. In order to do that, there are seven simple steps. First, you gather the data, then you clean up the data, you choose a model which can tell the difference between various parts of the data, you train the model with some of the data, you then evaluate it, and then you'll find that the model doesn't get everything right first time, so you tune it further, and then you get the correct output prediction. Here is an example of Jiva AI, which is such a artificially intelligent machine learning platform, which can tell the difference between a cancer and not a cancer on prostate MRI with nearly 90% accuracy. And then you take another artificial intelligent platform and it changes the entire 2D screen of an MRI into a 3D printed prostate. Here is such an example of a 3D printed prostate on the left with the tumor very close to the sphincter. And here is the real prostate removed by robotic surgery after 3D printed planning. And I can tell you that early data shows that it can reduce positive surgical margins. If you are interested in the subject further, I urge you to take a look at this article on AI and urology. We cover over a hundred papers. The majority lead with diagnosis. The others are on outcome predictions, such as PCNL outcomes. A few are about treatment plans, such as drug-resistant prostate cancer, and then surgical skills evaluation, which you will hear about further. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our two panelists, both Californian urologists, Jamie Landman from UC Irvine and Andrew Hung from the University of South California in Keck. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Dr. Desgupta, Dr. Hung, members and guests, thank you for the kind opportunity to present on the current state of AI and urologic imaging. The first computer was built during World War II by Alan Turing. He was able to crack the German communication code, code created by the Enigma machine, which eventually ensured a safe Normandy landing. With this success, he published a paper in 1950 entitled Computing, Machinery, and Intelligence. In this paper, he proposed the first question of its kind, can machines think? With this question in mind, we will discuss the following. What is artificial intelligence? Where are we now with its use in neurologic imaging and outcomes? And where do we need to go? To put it simply, AI is any machine that mimics human behavior and intelligence. It performs a task that a human would do. While still in its infancy, AI has already upended entire industries and revolutionized the world as we know it. It is essentially our clear duty to understand and apply this force to medicine and optimize patient outcomes for urologic diseases. AI can be divided into three general, general categories by abilities. Narrow AI are machines that perform simple intelligent tasks, such as Google Search, IBM Watson, self-driving cars, Alexa, and Siri. General AI are machines that are self-aware and are able to think at the level of a human, a fictional example, of course, being C-3PO from Star Wars. And super AI are machines that are self-evolving and ever-improving with intelligence that will be superior to that of humans, like the fictional HAL from Space Odyssey. Our entire society has already come to depend on a myriad of these AI algorithms. Now, there are a handful of ways to teach a machine to mimic human thought and behavior. Broadly, these are divided into two strategies, machine learning and deep learning. The machine learning model uses human intelligence to code information into a format that a computer algorithm can understand. And then the algorithm uses statistics and repetition to learn or to produce a correct answer. 
deep learning conversely, like convolutional neural networks, are able to take information from the world as it's found and then learn how to understand this data to produce the right answer. These algorithms need one simple thing, data. With the widespread use of EMR and many realms of urology still in their early stages of discovery, the field is truly ripe and all ready to harvest. There are vast amounts of data that are untapped and the development of AI has been crucial to harvesting this information for future research. Now let's discuss some current developing applications of AI in urologic imaging. One area of urology that has already begun to harness AI's power to solve complex problems is urologic oncology. Management of urologic malignancies typically entail detailed patient histories, biopsies, imaging studies, and these offer an inventory of data that can be analyzed or applied towards advanced AI algorithms. Our colleagues at UCI in the departments of radiology working with our machine learning center has taken the first steps to help us move towards better management of prostate disease. As you know, a typical MR, MRI has more than a million voxels perfect for training in AI. And they were able to successfully create a deep learning architecture composed of three convolutional neural networks that were capable of accurately differentiating and segmenting the transition zone and peripheral zone of the prostate. This demonstrates the feasibility of using AI to do the first step of the PIRAD scoring system and opens the door to creating an AI architecture that can conceivably automate the entire PIRAD score. The AI was able to accurately segment prostates by zone. The PIRAD system, as you know, is a complex scoring system that involves some subjectivity from one radiologist to another. And while studies like this meta-analysis analysis published by Wu and colleagues show improving sensitivity and specificity, the PIRED score, there remains significant variability in the sensitivity and specificity from study and study, from study to study. This is exactly the kind of problem for which artificial intelligence is better equipped than humans. Images serve as the question, pathology the answer, and the AI can rapidly find higher order patterns to predict outcomes while removing subjectivity from the process. Imagine simply taking an MRI, clicking a button, and your computer spits out the likelihood of cancer quicker and more accurately than any single human could. The foundation has been laid and we currently have the building blocks needed to do this. We just need to assemble them. Another visual feat being tackled by AI is the pathology. Many research teams have been working to develop algorithms that can read prostate biopsy histology and produce Gleason grade scores. The Google Health team trained a deep learning algorithm to read prostate histopathology slides by using expert evaluated slides combined with post biopsy clinical outcomes. This illustrates an important challenge for training AI and the Google Health team experimented with a creative solution. Unlike oncologic radiology, where imaging data sets can be paired to biopsies and an algorithm can rapidly find patterns to allow it to outperform humans in predicting pathology from images. Gleason's grading histologic sites present a unique problem for AI where the best available solution is based on our subjective and humanly imperfect performance. The best theoretical that a machine could perform is our own collective performance. Now, a single program able to provide Gleason grades quicker and better than any one individual and readily available to anyone would still be a powerful tool, but the Google team incorporated an important element, ground truth data, cancer specific outcomes. So by including these outcomes into the ground truth data, they were able to train an AI to produce risk scores that were more accurate than the scores generated by pathologists. While no longer a Gleason score, the AI was more accurate. As surgeons, it's time for us to wake up. Here we have the study published in European Urology by Scholjar and colleagues that demonstrates how AI can augment and improve direct visual imaging and algorithm designed with the bladder tumor detection on cystoscopy. The authors were able to train an algorithm they called Cystonet using cystoscopy images from histologically confirmed bladder tumors. The tumors were imaged manually uh, as you can see here in green, and the algorithm was able to segment images of the tumors as you see in blue. The algorithm was trained using over 2,700 images from 95 patients and later validated using a data set from 54 patients. Cystonet was able to tag tumors on the screen in real time as a uro urologist conducted cystoscopy. From the validation data set, the program detected 39 of 41 papillary tumors, all three of three flat bladder cancers and had a sensitivity of around 91% and a specificity of approximately 99%. 
when the algorithm flags something, the physician could simply move the cystoscope closer and the algorithm would reassess. You can see here where it flagged a small diverticulum, but upon approaching it with the cystoscope, the algorithm recognized that it wasn't a tumor. Switching gears to endourology, here's a smartphone app that works in a similar manner, but has been trained to identify household objects like a remote or a pen. In our Curiosity and Innovation Lab at UCI, we adapted this commercially available technology and applied it to urology in a project which, for which we have video abstract at this very AUA meeting. We use similar methods to train the smartphone program to take the cystoscope imaging and identify stone composition using 200 stones, 50 calcium oxalate monohydrate, 50 cysteine, 50 uric acid, and 50 mixed struvite. We used a combination of images of stones sitting in a basin of saline and stones planted in pig kidneys. The program was able to recognize an implanted struvite stone in real time using a ureteroscope. Here's the same thing, but with a, with a uric acid stone. In a basin full of saline, the algorithm correctly identified 94% of stones. In the pig kidney, it identified 87% of stones. After training, three experienced fellowship trained endourologists are, at our institution were only 58% accurate. This prototype recognition protocol, as we called it, was designed by our LIFT fellows and was very humbling to our faculty. In another curiosity and innovation uh, laboratory uh, project from UCI that has been accepted at the upcoming World Congress of Endourology, highlights uh, the problem ripe for an artificially intelligent solution. Stone disease is a chronic disease, 75% of patients having a second stone after their first. At best, using all the available data we have now, including stone analysis, urine analyses, with all the research experience, medications, and procedures, we largely tell people to drink more water. Many of us look at stones as a simple solution. Calcium plus oxalate equals calcium oxalate stones. And the only aspect we honestly understand is that dilution reduces concentrations. But urine is a complex mixture of solutes that have complex interactions and associations, many of which we don't yet understand. How we handle stones disease today is, is like this, like hot garbage. Our ability to render patients completely stone free and keep them from forming stones is crude and at best largely limited by the way we conduct our research. One of the major hindrances, of course, being our ability to accurately characterize stone burden. Ongoing research like this article published in the Journal of Endourology is begging to suggest that using 3D volumetry technology, using CT scan segmentations, three-dimensional calculus, <laughs> Calculi to calculate stone volumes is more accurate and represents more of what's found in, in validated formulas like the European ellipsoid formula for simple stone volume estimates based on diameter. We've not been able to accurately track stones as they grow in vivo alongside the urine solution ratios that produce them. One of the important data points we rely on in research is stone disease for stone disease is stone burden and stone diameter. At very best, these are very rough estimates of stone volume and don't allow us to accurately and precisely track stone growth in patients. One reason 3D technologies aren't currently used is that they're very time intensive. It can take a lot of time to accurately segment stones slice by slice on a CT scan and calculate volumes. To address this, we trained a convolutional neural network to take CT scans and generate three-dimensional renderings of kidney stones and calculate their volume. We identified 770 stones from 119 patients and stone volumes were manually segmented using 3D slicer. The algorithm was trained to automatically identify stones, segment them and calculate stone volumes. Using an analytical technique called dice score, we evaluated the degree of overlap between the AI calculated volumes and hand segmented ones. We also use a European ellipsoid formula to calculate stone volumes and compare to manually calculated stone segmentation. The convolutional neural network had a dice score of 0.56 and a Pearson score of 0.82. The EUA formula had a Pearson correlation of 0.75. So AI segmented volumes performed better than the validated EUA formula, but not quite as well as manually segmented stone volumes. While technology like this clearly has a ways to go, the standard by which we study and treat more than just stone disease will need to dramatically change as we develop the capability to more accurately assess what's going on with our patients and how to help them. 
This was a perfect example of a problem that we have not yet solved, but we now have the tools that hold real potential. And if we can more accurately evaluate what stones are doing in our patients and automate the process so we rapidly gather this data, further intelligent systems can help us understand better what need to, needs to be done to treat these patients. Yet another example of a harvest in progress waiting to happen. After a bite-sized appetizer of what we're doing in AI, neurologic imaging, what do we make of all of this? Just thinking about what comes next for AI and its application to urology and general medicine, we can't help but be utterly amazed. Artificial intelligent capabilities are taking off at an accelerated pace and the technology is evolving and improving and we see it every day in the devices we carry in our pockets and even in the children, the games our children play. And here we are in the medical community, which can be a bit entrenched in tradition and sometimes slow to develop and adopt new ideas. Industries around us are being upended, revolutionized, and radically changed. They are becoming data-driven, more efficient, and more powerful. They are reaching more people and rapidly expanded the collective human knowledge using artificial intelligence tools to accelerate the pace. The day is coming when endoscopes will identify stone composition, automatically tailor and optimize energy settings in real time, and AI-driven robotic platforms will have perfect strong free rates. CT scams will come with tools that better predict outcomes that any single physician can possibly do. Histological slides will tell us more about a patient's prognosis than they can today, and unsolved problems will have novel and powerful solutions that human brain power couldn't discover alone. The foundations for these technologies exist now, and we need to build upon them. We have a duty and responsibility to collaborate, develop, and launch technologies that will improve our patient care and our ability to care for more patients in the future. So this is where the rubber hits the road. AI is in its infancy and has already had a massive influence on our lives and will continue to grow, bringing enormous value to patients. It's exciting to see where this will go in the near term future. I would like to thank Mr. Kalon Morgan and Mr. Rohit Bat, two of our wonderful Lit Fellows for assistance in preparing the content and animations for this presentation and thank you for your attention. Good morning, my name is Andrew Hung and I will share with you our work assessing surgical competence with artificial intelligence. Our work is sponsored by the National Institutes of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, a multi-year intuitive surgical clinical research grant, as well as the National Cancer Institute. For the last many years, my team at the University of Southern California has recorded surgical video during the robotic prostatectomy synchronized with systems data directly from the DaVinci robot. This systems data includes both instrument tracking as well as system events. And from this, we have derived automated performance metrics or summary metrics over these systems data. The subject of automated performance metrics has now been on the cover art of four issues of the Journal of Urology. In the very beginning, we looked at automated performance metrics over an entire case. This was the first uh, paper where we described automated performance metrics. And here is an illustrative example of two surgeons, one having done thousands of cases, prostatectomies, and the other just starting on their learning curve. And truly, they look different, performing the exact same step of the prostatectomy. Early on, we realized that with such immense amount of data, 30 seconds, or excuse me, 30 times per second, systems data is refreshed and the automated performance metrics are rich in information. How would we possibly learn from all this data? Machine learning seemed like a natural partner. This is published in JAMA Surgery where we took 70 cases, each case with its own set of automated performance metrics, tagged with a clinical label, in this case, the length of stay after prostatectomy. And we trained a machine learning model to be able to predict the length of time uh, after surgery in the hospital. So then in the prediction phase with brand new cases of, of, of prostatectomies with their own sets of automated performance metrics, we were able to predict with an 85% accuracy whether patients were gonna stay one or two days in the hospital or more than two days after prostatectomy. Over the years, we have increased our granularity or sophistication. Then we started reporting these automated performance metrics during each of the 12 steps of the prostatectomy. 
instead of summarizing them over the course of an entire operation. In this particular study, we used a deep learning model to predict time to urinary continence recovery after radical prostatectomy. We know that for outcomes, both patient factors as well as surgeon factors make a difference. And we specifically focused on urinary continence recovery. There are 16 clinical pathological features we examined, as well as surgeon factors, which were 41 automated performance metrics siloed into each of 12 steps of the prostatectomy. So altogether with over 500 features per case. Looking at 100 cases that had full uh, follow-up data, we found that a deep learning-based survival analysis using both the patient factors as well as the surgeon factors had the best performance, the best concordance index or area under the curve. And with machine learning, you're also able to look at of those 500 features per case, which were most predictive or were most helpful for the models to predict a correct time to urinary continence recovery. What we found was of the top 10, all were surgeon factors, all were automated performance metrics, no patient factors. Of the top 10, five were metrics during the vesicoureteral anastomosis or the reconstructive step of the prostatectomy. And finally, of the top five, three, had to do with the wrist articulation metrics during with the right instrument. And these are the relative weights or scores of these top 10 features. Realizing that the anastomotic step was lighting up from the prior work, we've spent more time delving further into that particular step. And we've now coined detailed automated performance look, metrics, looking at the individual maneuvers that make up suturing. This is our most contemporary work, a survival analysis using surgeon skill metrics, as well as patient factors in predicting continence recovery. Again, patient factors, the same patient factors and surgeon factors. Surgeon factors included, again, these 41 automated performance metrics siloed or summarized in those 12 steps of the prostatectomy but we add on granular suturing performance metrics. The, uh, the 41 metrics, we describe them now as summary APMs per step. And the detailed APMs are the metrics reported in those few seconds during needle handling or needle positioning when the surgeon drives the needle through the tissue and all the suture management. So metrics being reported in very, very small periods of time. Further, we include RACE, which is the Robotic Anastomosis uh, Competency Evaluation, or suturing technical skills of how the surgeon positions the needle in its grasper, uh, needle entry, how the needle tip enters the tissue, needle driving, suture placement, suture approximation, and how well the surgeon ties his or her knots. And so if you add on the detailed APMs as well as race, this is what we see that the individual data lines, the summary APMs and detailed APMs did perform similarly. But what stood out was that technical skills improved by 10 points, the ability for us to predict continence recovery or time to urinary continence recovery. All told, if you put all the data lines together, we approached an area of, under the curve of almost 0.8. And if you look at the feature ranking of all the metrics contributing to the correct prediction of when these patients are gonna recover, continence recovery, race metrics were three of the top five. Here's an example of how automated performance metrics were helps in a practical sense in training. Again, during the prostatectomy, during the vesicle urethral anastomosis, if you break that down, there are 12 stitches that are typically thrown on the urethral stump side, as well as on the bladder neck side. And if you look at one individual stitch, there are three things that typically happen during a stitch that's thrown. The needle is, is positioned with the grasper, the needle is actually driven through the tissue, and finally there is suture cinching. If you look at just that middle substep during needle driving, we see that the gesture is different. The needle driving gesture differs in which hand is being used, how the wrist rotates, whether clockwise or counterclockwise, and how the needle is grabbed in relation to the grasper. All told, 
we created a classification system of every possible gesture that can be utilized and color coded it. And here we documented over 70 anastomoses done by faculty as well as by residents at our institution. What was the practice pattern? And we found that, for example, at this particular five o'clock position on the posterior urethral stump, the vast majority of gestures were done in a predictable manner. The 13% of surgeons who did it in a random fashion based on the automated performance metrics took longer. They failed in their attempts to needle drive and furthermore uh, caused more tissue trauma. We created a step-by-step -step tutorial or guide from the very first stitch of the anastomosis to the last and all driven by data, all driven by automated performance metrics of which were the ideal gestures to utilize. From this particular project, we realized that recognizing the suture gestures was important, but it's a time intensive process to identify or review every single individual uh, needle drive that a resident, for example, does. So we partnered with folks at uh, Caltech in uh, uh, determining which uh, was the ideal, uh, uh, which gestures are being utilized. So we looked at the five most common uh, suturing gestures. We plugged them into a two process deep learning model. And we, in our early work, have been able to predict with a 70% accuracy, which gesture was used just looking at the live video clips. Similar to suturing, we thought that, well, on the dissection or tissue dissection side, there are similar uh, repetitive patterns that can be seen and that the gestures uh, do repeat themselves. In this particular project, we looked at the partial nephrectomy and the hyalur uh, dissection. And we see that of all the surgical movements that happen during the hyalur dissection, there's the discrete active dissection maneuvers and many others. And then within dissection, there are different gestures that do repeat themselves over and over again. So of all the surgical, surgical maneuvers, 57% are dissection. Everything else is considered supporting. If we focus on just the dissection, active dissection movements, and these are with the curved monopolar scissors, there are either blunt dissection maneuvers or there are sharp dissection maneuvers. And there are even combination gestures that involve uh, either multiple movements with the single hand or both hands. What we found was first that experts were more efficient in almost all the dissection gestures executed or performed. But further, that experts exhibited different gesture choices in all the anatomic zones. For example, around the vein, experts used much more of the blunt peel push maneuver and a lot less of the hot cut sharp dissection maneuver. And then around the artery, experts favored pedicalizing as a combination maneuver uh, over novice surgeons. If you watched a video clip of tissue dissection and you decoded it into these discrete gestures, you might see something like spread, spread, hook, burn, peel. And that is your sequence of uh, surgery. Here you see each row across a different neurovascular bundle dissection from uh, either uh, uh, 22 cases on the top that recovered erectile function 12 months after uh, prostatectomy, or the bottom group, 18 cases where these cases didn't, uh, did recover recovery, the top cases did not. And uh, this is the decoding of those first 100 dissection gestures. Plugging this data into a machine learning model uh, it can predict with an 80% accuracy whether or not the case is recovered, the patient's recovered function uh, 12 months after surgery or not. And if you looked at one specific case, this is the left neurovascular bundle, first 100 uh, gestures, and asked these models, well, what about this particular sequence was most helpful in determining that 12-month erectile function outcome? Well, uh, the, the bright yellow indicating the most important, the dark uh, blue to purple indicating not important at all. What we found was that 
the, the part of the sequence that was most important were the series, the repetitive series of cold cut. So all, almost all the important sequences in this particular case were cold cuts. This is what allowed the model to correctly uh, categorize this particular case as one that would recover function or not. So here are my take home points. Yes, artificial intelligence can assess surgical competency through automated performance and technical skills that can predict patient outcomes. Computer vision that can recognize discrete surgical gestures, whether from suturing or during suturing or dissection. And finally, machine learning can recognize the ideal surgical patterns that leads to ideal surgical Thank you for your time.